Now, air leakage also has some other consequences that are important to mention. We call that wind washing. And what wind washing is, is when we have air infiltrate through a wall cavity, it scavenges away heat. Imagine if you were to go outside on a windy day and all you had on was a really nice sweater. A sweater may be a good insulator, but because air can flow through it, it scavenges the heat away and the sweater really doesn't work very well at keeping you warm. That's because of wind washing. Uh, so that's why we have air barriers and that's why we want to have an air barrier system and part of that system is air sealing and stopping all those cracks and gaps that prevent this air from blowing through the insulation which scavenges away uh, its, its usefulness and, and its effective R value. It also reduces comfort, it places a strain on the HVAC system, um, you know, it causes unwanted moisture infiltration and can cause buildings to be under um, negative pressures which can cause combustion appliances like fireplaces and water heaters to backdraft. So when we have a structure that's under a negative pressure, that's a problem in terms of life safety as well as it is moisture and energy efficiency. Now this is a chart that shows you the impact of air infiltration on insulation. Now this was a study that was done back in the 1990s by uh, a laboratory called Holometrics. And what you're looking at on the left hand side, the vertical axis, is a uh, R value goes, goes from 0 to 14. And then when you look at the wind speed across the horizontal axis, you can see as we increase the wind speed, look at how much that that R value drops of the insulation. So for example, if we take our insulation and go from uh, an R4, or let's say we had a five mile an hour wind, unprotected insulation's R value would drop from R14 to R7. So let me say that again. If we have R14 insulation and it's exposed to air infiltration from even a five mile an hour wind, it almost cuts the efficiency of that insulation in half. So that's why it's so important that the code is addressing these issues of air infiltration. Not only to stop air from infiltrating in through all the cracks and gaps, but also to protect the effective R value of the insulation. Now let's take a look at some of the causes of air infiltration and exfiltration in homes. Number one, the wind. We're all pretty familiar with that. Uh, as wind blows against one side of the structure, that puts it under a positive pressure and that pushes air into the structure, which pushes out the air you pay to heat and cool. So on the other side of the building, it's going to be under a negative pressure. Second cause of uh, air infiltration and exfiltration in homes is what we call a stack effect. Warm air is more buoyant than cold air, so it wants to rise. So we typically tend to see air infiltrating into the lower parts of the structure and exfiltrating out through the upper parts of the structure. And then finally, mechanical systems. When we have HVAC equipment that has duct leakage to the outdoors, that can cause the building to be under a positive or a negative pressure, which can have big impacts on the overall building performance. So that's why it's so important that, and why we have a mandatory measure within the code to seal our ducts. Okay, so let's talk about some common sense places where we might want to seal. We should be looking for uh, plumbing penetrations and pipes uh, between conditioned and non-conditioned spaces to be sealed. Another important place to air seal is around electrical penetrations. That's why we often see uh, between conditioned and unconditioned spaces and so forth, we, we seal uh, wiring penetrations. If you've ever held your hand over an outlet and felt a draft, that's because there's air infiltrating or exfiltrating through that uh, opening. Uh, here is a great example of what can happen when you have unconditioned controlled air uh, infiltration, in this case exfiltration. As warm moist air exfiltrates through the opening in the wall, it comes in contact with the cold OSB in this case and you know it can condense and then over a period of time that moisture builds up and of course mold will start to grow. Anytime you have a surface relative humidity above 70 percent, then that's prime conditions for mold to grow. So when we control air exfiltration and infiltration, we go a long way to helping to reduce the potential for mold growth and moisture problems in walls, in addition to making our homes more energy efficient. Now, uh, so plumbing penetrations, they need to be uh, sealed. Uh, any, here, for example, we can see uh, someone using a smoke device that allows us to determine, you know, whether the structure's under negative or positive pressure, more importantly, where the big leaks are at. So here, for example, you can see that there's an attic bypass. You can see that there's a great amount of air that can infiltrate or exfiltrate, not only where the wiring's at, but also up in attics where you have interior walls that have drywall, and there's a lot of air that uh, comes up through those locations as well. 
So we definitely want to seal all these penetrations, uh, and that can be done a variety of ways. Uh, spray foam is one, caulks and sealants is another. We want to make sure that they're resilient enough to expand and contract with building envelope. It's important during the inspection process that we make sure that these, this air sealing is done adequately. Like here, for example, it doesn't do any good to do a half job here and uh, create, you know, having foam in the opening but really not sealing the leak. Uh, also, it's important to recognize that any drop ceilings or penetration in the attic that they need to be uh, boarded and sealed. We can't have big attic bypasses like this where air can easily exfiltrate up into the attic and have a lot of heat loss. We, this could be a drop ceiling. Uh, this could be a condition where uh, there's a, an HVAC chase, and this is why we don't typically like to see uh, building cavities for return air duct, and the code does not allow us to have building cavities be supply air duct chases. But in any event, these are areas that we want to be on the lookout for with regards to air uh, infiltration, exfiltration. Here's an example of chimney chases where we have a chimney, and the framing area around it is open. That would be a violation of the code. That has to be sealed because it the airspace around that chimney can exhaust a lot of air. Now this is a graphic of how you might go about air sealing a chimney chase. Um, actually, uh, it's important to recognize that we may have to use some fire resistant materials here. Uh, but Building uh, America, the Building America program, if you go to the Department of Energy's website for Building America, they got some excellent uh, guidebooks on how to seal these difficult to seal areas. You can find a comprehensive starting point of the Building America resources at the Building America Solutions Center, which is online at www.basc.pnnl.gov. Another area that the code uh, takes a serious look at that's different than before is this issue of having exposed insulation uh, behind building cavities and like such as uh, fireplaces and tubs. So here, for example, you can see that there's actually um, a solid board material or an air barrier, as they call it, that is over the insulation. So typically where you would have a tub, you would just have that tub right up against the insulation. That's not what we're looking for here in the new code. We're trying to make sure that there's no insulation exposed to where you can have air flowing around it, which is heat transfer by convection, which scavenges away heat. Um, duct penetrations, they have to be foamed and sealed, of course, uh, where we're looking at cantilevers and rim joist areas, like we see here, that needs to be air sealed. Uh, fireplaces, here you can see, for example, that uh, there, even though there'll be a gypsum uh, wallboard covering over this, uh, this fireplace location, you can see that there's a lot of hollow space behind where that gypsum board will be, and the insulation's exposed to the air. Cannot be the case. You have to completely put an air barrier around that entire space. Uh, and so those are one of the items on, on the checklist that we're looking for. Also, foundation penetrations. So in general, we're trying to seal all the penetrations, um, also making sure uh, that uh, where we have exposed insulation behind showers, tubs, uh, and so forth, that, that is covered up with an air barrier uh, so that we don't have the heat scavenging effects of air infiltration. Uh, another requirement in the code is uh, that wood-burning fireplaces shall have gasketed doors and outdoor combustion air. Uh, there have been some reports around the country that some of the fireplaces are not really engineered very well to handle these gaskets, and so we've been seeing a fair amount of glass breakage. So that's something the code has taken a serious look at. But certainly we want to definitely see that uh, we have outdoor combustion air uh, to provide for fireplaces because we, we don't want that air for the combustion of the fire to be coming from the indoors because we have to reheat or recool that air. Now before when I was talking about fenestration and the NFRC label with regards to glazing, uh, I was referring to uh, heat loss uh, and heat gain. Another important component to the label is its air leakage. And in this case, um, this window has an air leakage of 0.2 cubic feet of air per minute per square foot. And the, NFR, the, the code requirement is no more than 0.3 CFM per square foot. So this window would qualify. But it's important to recognize that this is on the label and something that we definitely want to be uh, looking for in the selection of windows and also in the inspection uh, of the building. Another area that are big energy leakers in homes are can lights. And these can lights need to be IC rated, which that means insulation contact, and labeled uh, with no penetrations between the inside and recessed fixture and the ceiling cavity. In other words, it's got to be sealed uh, appropriately. Uh, and it could be sealed with a gasket or caulk between the housing and the uh, the wall or ceiling covering. So we're trying to 
we're, number one, we're trying to get an IC rated fixture that's tested in accordance with AASTM 283, which measures the air infiltration rate of the can itself, and we don't want that to be any more than two cubic feet of um, uh, airflow per minute. Um, but we also want to make sure that we seal where the can light interfaces with the ceiling drywall, for example. And that way we make sure that we've done a lot to stop air infiltration at these can light locations, which they leak a lot.